We have one council. We have two council. I think we're ready to begin then. Hopefully there's not a third council that I missed somewhere. Okay. Mr. Tozier, I believe you represent the appellant. Did you wish to reserve time for rebuttal? Five minutes, please, Your Honor. Okay. Uh, I will do my utmost to let you know when you arrive at 15 minutes. Thank you. Uh, you may proceed. Good afternoon. May it please the court and counsel. My name is Garrett Tozier from Shutson Bowen. And it is my privilege this morning or this afternoon to represent the appellants, Westbury at Lake Brandon Investments LLC and GSRP LLC in this appeal from the final judgment and denial of a hearing following a bench trial on plaintiff Carolyn at Westbury LLC's claims for a breach of contract and breach of the implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing under Delaware law. Um, the trial court reversibly erred in misinterpreting and at times outright ignoring uh, key provisions in two contracts. In its final judgment, the court's analysis commingled various parties, agreements, and applicable law. Um, at its core, this appeal involves two agreements between four entities. GSRP and Carolyn entered an LLC agreement in 2013 and formed the entity Westbury for the purchases of purchasing a multifamily residential complex. And that is governed by Delaware law. Then Westbury and a non-party to this litigation, Blue Brock Partners LLC entered a property management agreement for the purposes of managing the subject property, which is governed by Florida law. So we have GSRP and Carolyn under the Delaware contract, and we have Blue Rock and Westbury under the Florida contract. Now in its operative complaint, Carolyn thinks that it should have received more than its 2% investment when the property sold under 2016, pursuant to section 5.2 of the Delaware agreement. Uh, in that complaint, GSR, uh, Carolyn claimed that GSRP was unauthorized to remove it as a managing member, uh, pursuant to the ground stated in a June 2016 letter attached to that complaint. It claimed that Carolyn had not actually defaulted under the LLC agreement and that there had been no evidence of any default presented. Um, and also Carolyn claimed that it had not received notice or opportunity to cure under sections 10.2 and 10.3 of the Delaware agreement. However, this court's de novo review of those two contracts will require and shows a different analysis that first, this court must analyze Blue Rock's conduct under the Florida agreement and then turn to GSRP's conduct under the Delaware agreement to see whether it had complied in removing Carolyn. That's it. We do not evaluate any conduct by Carolyn because we have never alleged a default by Carolyn under any agreement. That's because there are five grounds for removal, each titled a separate sponsor for cause event under the Delaware agreement, and the, only one of which is needed to remove Carolyn under the agreement. Uh, for the We advanced two alternative grounds below, but we're, for the purposes of this appeal, we're focusing on 8.1 G3 of that Delaware agreement, which focuses solely on Blue Rock's conduct under the property management agreement, the Florida agreement. It does not refer to a default by Carolyn or anything by, done by Carolyn under the LLC agreement. And that's important because that fails to trigger the notice and cure provision in section 10.3 of the LLC agreement under the Delaware contract. Mr. That is your, we, we, we've read this. Yes, and it appears in a way your your client is trying to use these agreements as a sword and a shield. You use them when you want to, but you also hold them up when you don't want to be accountable because only the operating agreement allows your client to remove CW, but you refuse to concede that there's a notice requirement in the operating agreement for CW. What you're doing is you're relying on the letters to Blue Rock as notice for CW when it doesn't even mention CW whatsoever. These are two agreements, one of which the operating agreement repeatedly refers to the PMA, repeatedly. And I've looked at uh, Judge Nielsen's order. I don't see any co-mingling. I see that he separated them out, actually articulated the differences in both. But tell me, if you're going to, your client's going to remove CW, then why don't you comply with 10.2 for the notice and the opportunity to cure? Because the PMA talks about cure, but doesn't even articulate, nor does it express a how it goes about curing. The only cure provision that's articulated is in 10.2. 
of the operating agreement. So if you're going to remove CW, why can't the court look at the operating agreement to see if you gave them proper notice? Yes, Your Honor, I'll, I'll, I'll go through that. But first, I'd like to clarify that Section 10.2 just deals with the manner of notice. Um, if any notice is required, it doesn't impose in any independent notice obligation. It is just the, uh, the functional it function, functions um, of how notice is sent. Um, section 10.3 is the cure provision, and that speaks to a default by a member. So only GSRP or Carolyn. And therefore, it is not triggered because we have not alleged any default by Carolyn. The sponsor cause event um, speaks solely to Blue Rock's conduct under the property management agreement. So once this third party commits an uncured material breach under that property management agreement, that separate agreement, that triggers GSRP's rights under the language of 8.1. Yep, but the PMA doesn't say anything about a sponsored event. The PMA doesn't say anything about removing Carolyn. And the PMA doesn't say this agreement authorizes the removal of Carolyn, period. Correct. Yes. Um, the, so the, you we're, have to go back to the operating agreement like Judge Nielsen did. Yes. It's inescapable. The, it's inescapable. You've got some very rich clients, very rich. And they're, this agreement is supposed to be construed against them. When they hired Blue Rock, they were making $1.3 million operating a month, operating income. Then they were making $2.6 million. They made $10 million off this sale. And they claimed that Blue Rock and CW mismanaged the asset, even though they were making money, and even though they continued to hire and retain uh, Carolyn for other properties. And the notices refer to other properties other than the branded properties. And the notice okay. does, is not directed to Carolyn at all. Yet Mr. Singer, Mr. Silver argued below, this is a bunch of hullabaloo. It's semantics because Mr. Odet owns the same companies. He's at the helm of the same, but yet here you're trying to use the operating agreement as a sword, but yet below Mr. Silver said, it doesn't matter. Mr. Odet controls both. We don't have to comply with the operating agreement. So which is it? Well, we complied with the operating agreement because there was one condition precedent to allowing GSRP to remove Carolyn under the operating agreement as managing member. And that one condition precedent was obtaining the lender's approval key bank and getting that consent before it can proceed with the removal. It's because of the structure that Carolyn agreed to in this operating agreement that triggered the rights and, and, and the authorization for GSRP to remove Carolyn um, based solely on the conduct in the property management agreement. And Carolyn had, had noticed just by the plain language of the agreement that GSRP had the unilateral authority to do this once it received GSRP, uh, excuse me, once it received KeyBank's approval. And when we look to the terms, it, it just looks to the terms of the property management agreement in Florida law for determining when an uncured material breach has occurred. And that's in paragraph 3C of the property management agreement. And the court, trial court found that there were six material breaches of, or six breaches of the property management agreement, but then proceeded to engage in a, a factual fact-finding inquiry as to whether that constituted a material breach under, well, should have been Florida law because Blue Rock is the only, is bound solely by well, Florida law. Okay, but you also put an, a so-called expert up named Mr. Howard, who was very general and very vague, and he didn't have the, the qualifications that Mr. Burrow had. You also put up an expert uh, named Mr. Burrison, who didn't even review all your ledgers. Mr. Howard didn't even look at the general ledger. He admitted it. He admitted it. But yet the plaintiff's experts, you have a accountant saying that all of Blue Rock's financial reports complied with the accounting principles, there were immaterial errors, and user management would not have been affected by those insignificant differences. So are you saying the trial court couldn't consider that evidence? So we advanced two alternative sponsor for cause events in the trial court. Under 8.1 G1, it also allowed for the removal under, um, if there was gross um, misconduct or willful negligence, or maybe I have that backwards. Um, so that evidence would have gone to that, but we only need one of these sponsor for cause events to occur. And the sponsor for cause event, the word that we also relied on is G3. And that only pertains to an uncured material breach of the property management agreement. 
And because time was of the essence in that property management agreement, that takes the, um, the fact-finding inquiry that would have been required for Section 8.1G3 and Paragraph 3C, the obligation to um, submit reports by the 15th of each month, that takes that out of finding uh, that the fact finding out of the hands of the trier fact, um, as explained in the Rivervich Boatworks case and all the other cases that um, address a time of the essence clause in the context of a specific you know, monthly deadline. And it's important that these are ongoing monthly obligations because the 15th of the month, specifically October 15, 2015 financial reports, the last set of reports that were due before the property management agreement was terminated. Now, that's an important distinction that um, Carolyn has tried to um, try to um, muddy the waters with here is we have uh, a termination of the property management agreement is not part of the sponsor for cause event. It's just the, the December 7th, 2015 letter was simply terminated Carolyn. They haven't proven any damn, or, excuse me, <laughs> I'm making the same mistake now. The December 7th, 2015, 15 letter terminated Blue Rock property management agreement. However, it, uh, that wasn't required for GSRP to trigger or for a sponsor for cause event to happen. Um, and but also- Didn't you allege an affirmative defense that these were material breaches? Yes, and we okay, were allowed to hence, do so. Hence the plaintiff and Mr. Lopez putting on evidence that they weren't, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Well, that's correct because um, Excuse me. Um, yes, he was you know, able to do that because we were also contesting. Or in, but in see, reason, you're also agreement. using 8G for all these sponsored events when 8FI requires your client to give CW notice when they're going to sell the property. And they yes, didn't. Your Honor. And they didn't. If that finding is not supported by confidence. They did not do that. Uh, we respectfully disagree that finding is not supported by competent substantial evidence. The They allege, and the trial court's judgment says, that the sale happened on April 15, 2016. But their own, that sale contract that they attached to the complaint has a sale date of May 10, 2016. And that's important because we entered into evidence Mr. Oded's acknowledgement on April 21st, so a couple of weeks before that sale letter, where he acknowledges our intent to sell the property um, a few weeks prior to that. And well, intent, intent and an actual sale contract are two different animals. Yeah. Because Mr. Cool. Oded testified that he was familiar with a different buyer that bought a different piece of property. And he tried to relay to Mr. McKenzie or Mr. Goff or whoever, that mm -hmm. this particular property that was sold out from under CW was worth more. But Mr. McKenzie or Mr. Goff wouldn't have anything to do with it and didn't notify Mr. Oded, that this sale was pending. Well, we respectfully disagree on the Well, that was his testimony. I'm not saying it's true. <laughs> of course. Um, but uh, also, another important part about that is we're, so for the purposes of selling the property, we're under Delaware law and the LLC agreement. Um, GSRP has a unilateral authority to sell that property. Carolyn, even as the managing member, has no right to participate in that sales process. They have a right to be noticed under Correct. 8FI. Correct. And they, yes, they, and and they, they received, all right, we, we respectfully disagree. Mr. Odette admitted that on April 21st, he acknowledged their intent to sell the property. And in fact, responded with suggestions as to um, its sales price. But because GSRP had the unilateral authority, it um, didn't affect uh, the outcome. And another important aspect of that is that they they proved no resulting damages um, resu from that sale. The trial court entered final judgment based on the actual sales price, assuming that Carolyn remained as managing member. They didn't cross appeal that determination, and they didn't enter any other additional evidence of damages that would have resulted had Carolyn been able to participate and um, you know get a higher attempt to get a higher sales price. And that's discussed in um, the third issue in our brief that Carolyn, to which Carolyn never responded. So um, with that in mind, um, and, th and that goes also to the um, to count two, um, you also need resulting damages from any um, contractual uh, gap that you can assert. But Carolyn here has only asserted um, direct um, breaches of contract. And so that that's why that can't, 
cannot um, be sustained as well for the reasons that we argued in our brief. GSRP had the unilateral authority once a sponsor for cause event occurred. And this is just uh, simply the bargain that Carolyn entered into. Um, and, you know, that's a bad bargain for Carolyn. Well, under Delaware law and Florida law, um, the freedom of contracts um, supports and upholds both, both instances. So I will uh, reserve the rest of my time for rebuttal if the court doesn't have any other questions. Doesn't appear so. <clears throat> May it please the court, Anthony. One second, unless you want to start off uh, with a bunch of time already subtracted. Let me clear the time, please. Okay. We have a new clock. <laughs> oh, do we? <laughs> we have a technologically challenged uh, center chair today. Yeah. Clock's good. It's the operator. Mr. Lopez, you're clear. You're good to go, sir. <laughs> Wonderful. May it please the court, Anthony Lopez, on, on behalf of the appellee. Uh, first and foremost, I apologize for the length of the briefing in this case. Uh, the initial brief was 50 pages long. I, I frankly agree with, with Judge Sleet's analysis. This case is actually relatively simple. Um, if you read the, the brief, it, it seems complex, but it's really simple. There are two agreements. There's an operating agreement that has uh, a very specific notice provision and has very specific uh, sponsor for calls, cause events that are the only ways of depriving Caroline with its promote in this case under section five. Um, the only letter ever sent to Caroline, and this is, these are undisputed facts uh, at the trial court level, uh, was a letter dated June 27, 2016, in which the appellant uh, attempted to remove uh, Carolyn as the managing member in an effort to deprive them of their uh, $1.190 million promote. Important to note that this letter came some 15 days before the closing was to occur. Uh, and in our mind, this is the ultimate uh, gotcha attempt uh, by the appellants in this case. The, the notice provision of the operating agreement is extremely clear. And it specifically says on page 35, notice of default and opportunity to cure. No member shall be in default of its obligations under this agreement unless and until it has been provided written notice thereof specifying the details of such default and shall have been allowed at least 30 days from the receipt of such notice an opportunity to cure same provided that if such default is non-monetary and is not capable of being cured within 30 days uh, from the defaulting excuse me 30 day time period the defaulting member shall be allowed a reasonable opportunity to cure same, but in no event more than 90 days from the giving of the notice. Clearly, uh, the trial court found, uh, based on the evidence adduced at trial, that the only letter sent to Carolyn that was an attempt to comply with this notice provision was the June 27, 2016 letter. And the trial court found that this letter uh, was completely uh, deficient because it didn't comply with the operating agreement. It's important to note, and I think appellate confuses the issue, that Blue Rock can be terminated as the property manager, and that does not necessarily equate to Caroline being removed as the managing member or losing its promote. Uh, the only sponsor for cause event that we're dealing with this on appeal, which it, because it, by appellant's own admission, they have um, I guess, forgone or waived um, 8.1 GI, which is the fraud sponsor for cause event. And there was no evidence at trial uh, to support a claim of fraud, misappropriation of funds or gross negligence. And the final judgment specifically picked up on that and referenced that there was no evidence to support that assertion. So the only sponsor for cause event that they could assert is 8.1 GIII, which specifically says any uncured breach by sponsor's affiliate of any material obligation. Now that's extremely important because number one, 8.1 GIII, if that is the provision that they're going to be traveling under and it seems based on counsel's admission, it is. And it seems like based on counsel's admission, he also agreed Carolyn never defaulted under the operating agreement. Notice was still required to be given to Carolyn because Blue Rock, was an affiliate 
under the operating agreement of Caroline. Therefore, under the notice provision, it specifically says under 10.3 that notice was required to be given to Caroline as the managing member. They were also required to be given an opportunity to cure. And as a matter of fact, the agreement goes even further. It says it actually carves out the only time notice is not required to be given to Caroline. And under 10.3 on page 35 of the operating agreement, it says in the last sentence, no notice and cure right shall be applicable to a default resulting from fraud, gross negligence, or willful misconduct, or from a failure to repay a delinquency loan when due under. Now, based on counsel's own admission, uh, that clearly wasn't applicable at, at this point or stage in the proceeding. It certainly wasn't applicable at the trial stage because the court specifically made findings in the final judgment that there were no facts to support uh, holding Carolyn in default under that section of the sponsor for cause events. Therefore, the notice provision of the operating agreement, which is very clear and unambiguous, required that GSRP and Westbury provide notice to Carolyn that, hey, Blue Rock isn't performing up to what we consider to be adequate standards. You know, they're giving us financials uh, late. Uh, they've done it six times. Um, please make sure they fix this. That is the whole point of 8.1 GIII is that notice is to be given to Caroline that its affiliate, Blue Rock in this case, isn't doing something it should have been doing. And Mr. the simple fact- Mr. Yes, Lopez, one question, sir. I noticed that Mr. Oded uh, responded on behalf of Blue Rock Partners on November 12, 2015 to uh, GSRP about the alleged deficiencies does that waive the notice to Carolyn or not? Absolutely not. And under Delaware law, which is the uh, the law that applies to this agreement, the case law is pretty clear that notice is something to be strictly uh, complied with when there's a specific notice provision in an operating agreement, PR acquisitions LLC versus Midland funding, as well as Cornell Glasgow LLC versus Lagrange properties. Both of these are Delaware cases specifically provide that compliance is required, not mere notice. As a matter of fact, in the PR acquisitions case, uh, that was what uh, the appellant was complaining of, that they had given notice to an escrow agent and that, act that actual notice was given to the appellee. And what the Delaware court said there is, well, we're going to look to the notice provision in that agreement. And that notice provision in that agreement specified the exact person, the entity that that notice was supposed to go to, as well as the address and other details. This uh, operating agreement is, first of all, entered into between two very sophisticated parties, has a very specific and clear uh, notice provision and a notice of default and opportunity to cure provision. So even despite Mr. Oded responding to a letter received by Blue Rock as it relates to uh, some late financials, and again, it's not that the financials were never given, they were late. Um, it doesn't, they were still required to give notice to Caroline and an opportunity to cure. And that is what's fatal to their claim at this juncture in the proceeding. And this is also what was fatal to their claim at the trial court. And the judge was very articulate in his final judgment saying they did not comply with the notice provision. And at the end, this is the death knell uh, in terms of, uh, of their entire argument. We can also go into the analysis that uh, the court did as it related to the materiality of the alleged breaches by Blue Rock. Counsel, for some reason, is upset that Judge Nielsen looked at uh, Delaware law. Well, in order for Caroline to be in breach under the operating agreement 8.1 GIII, there has to be an uncured breach by sponsor's affiliate of any material obligation. And that's why the materiality uh, uh, legal analysis is so important. And that's why the trial judge said, look, it's not like they didn't give you financials. They gave you financials over the course of this multi-year relationship late six times. So that in the court's opinion was not a material breach that would allow the appellant to hold Carolyn in default under the operating agreement. Again, that's not even touching the fact that they didn't give adequate notice. 
So uh, the trial court, I think, went through exhaustive measures in writing the final judgment, uh, going through the case law, listening to all of the evidence. Uh, this, and I think the final judgment uh, is, is extremely solid and on all fours. Uh, moreover, as it relates to there are other arguments, course of dealing, and we can get into all of those. But I think, uh, Judge Sleet, you picked up on the simple fact that they didn't comply with the notice provision of the operating agreement. Council espouses that notice wasn't required. The operating agreement unambiguously required notice and an opportunity to cure. And there is not a single letter in the record down below where they gave notice to Carolyn and an opportunity to cure under the operating agreement. And with that, I will yield the rest of my time and rest on our brief unless your honors have questions. I do not see any questions. I thank you, counsel. Okay. All right, let me clear this. Mr. Tozier, you have your rebuttal time remaining. You may proceed. Thank you, your honor. I think it's uh, pretty telling that when um, citing and, and going through the language of section 8.1 G3 of the, op of the operating agreement that uh, friend on the other side stopped at the word material obligation and didn't keep reading in the property management agreement. It has to be the sp that sponsor for cause event has to be an uncured material breach in the property management agreement by Blue Rock. We have never alleged a default by Carolyn and that's why section 10.3 does not apply. Well, let's go back to the language because yes. it says in parentheses, after the expiration of any applicable pure, cure period, the PMA has absolutely no applicable cure period at all. It just says cure, period. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely ambiguous. So where do we go for the cure period? It appears we go to the operating agreement. Do we not? I would disagree, Your Honor. You see what I'm saying? If... Your client is just trying to use these favorably when it, when it favors them, but also as a shield. No, no, no. We don't want you to, to uh, enforce that. The PMA says nothing. It just says cure, period. How am I supposed to interpret that? Uh, the LLC agreement says, if, I just want to make sure we're talking about the correct agreements here, um, not the PMA, but the, because um, you're referring to the parentheses on page 3440 of the record. Yeah, but Any you just said a material obligation under the PMA. Well, what does the PMA say about cure? It just simply says, after any applicable notice and cure period, period. There's no definition, nothing. So where do we right. go? It, for, it, for it looks to period. the property management agreement and there is no opportunity to cure for this obligation. because. But you're trying to get rid essence. of Carolyn for this. And Another entity. For, your client shows. Wait a minute. Your client shows to have different agreements with different entities, and you got to do that at your own risk. And so does Carolyn, Your Honor. And this specific language allows us and authorizes us to do to take this specific action. And here's how we know also that the cure provision is not applicable here, based on, even though Blue Rock is the one that we're claiming in default. Because if you go look at the 8.1 G5, that fifth sponsor for cause event, it has specific notice and opportunity to cure rights to Carolyn based on its default of the Delaware agreement, based on Blue Rock's default under the order agreement. And it has specific information um, that needs to be provided, but we didn't invoke that provision. That's why, because we are allowed to remove Carolyn and just as managing member, we're not removing, we never removed Carolyn as a member of, of this LLC agreement. But Just you removed move them to the extent that you prohibited them from getting their, I guess it's called a promote. Correct. Call it a distribution. Well, that seems pretty, pretty specific. And that's the deal to Carolyn agreed. They, if, and if they signed days before you sell for $49 only million. Because, only because we did not receive the authorization from the lender. So we tried to comply and we only received that one condition precedent 10 days before we sent that notice letter in June, 2016. We comply with the one condition precedent. And if Carolyn is the one who's gonna make a, a bad bargain by letting, giving our clients authority to act in these specific circumstances, that is something that Delaware courts readily enforce. And um, unless this court has any other questions, we, we respectfully request for the reasons argued in the brief that no opportunity to cure was provided by section 10.3 of the operating agreement 
that, um, excuse me, that um, once the court made that finding for the October 2015 financials under Rybovich Boat Works, that constituted an unfair material breach of the property management agreement and therefore triggered GSRP's authority under the operating agreement to remove Carolyn as the manager. And we respectfully request reversal and remand for entry in our favor on both counts, unless the court has any other questions. I don't see any. Thank you, counsel. Thank you both. Thank well you. presented. And uh, we hope on behalf of the court, you all stay well. And we'll talk to you again soon, we hope. Well, thank you. Thank you.